Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Chris. This is um, part two of the Enduring Mystery of Jack the Ripper. We're at chapter four. I'll do another 17 minutes or so. And I'll go to chapter six. Yeah. I'm trying to break them down into 15 minute segments. And then I'll do up to there. And then I'll finish. But anyways. Got another rum and coke here. A little bit strong on the alcohol, but it's okay. I wanted to know. Anybody ever use these? You're probably saying, well, you got to show us what it is. out too many oh they are those little frozen cubes so they're stones they're melting now but they're stones and you put them in the freezer you melt them oh there you go how about that you put them in the freezer you melt them you melt them. Oh my gosh, Chris. You've been drinking just one rum and coke. What are you doing? You put them in the freezer and then you put them in your drink, your alcoholic drink, um, as an ice replacement so it doesn't water it down. Um, but my fear is that I like to chew on the ice, so I might forget. I wouldn't that. I mean, that'd be a big difference. But. I've never used them and I wonder if anyone has but Greg Greg I think you would love these not because you drink but because I bought these uh, I bought these for me and for my brother-in-law I bought him a set when I went to the boyhood home of your favorite president Woodrow Wilson in um, it's s so my last name is Stanton s-t-a-n-t-o-n and he was from born in S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N -N, but it's pronounced Stanton but I was calling it Staunton but yeah you would love him I know you're a big fan you say he's you as you like to say you go he's the tops and I was like all right and you go he's the best that's there ever been and I'm like okay every time you hear his name you said you start moonwalking so I know you're a big fan so I just thought I'd bring it up to you anyways we're going to go ahead and kick this off. This is the, um, chapter four of the Enduring Mystery of Jack the Ripper uh, from Lamino. But um, this is part two of this video. So without further ado, like and subscribe and let's get on with the video. Ramen that's healthy, wholesome, and jam-packed with life-sustaining protein. No, it's not magic. Come on, come it's the on. special cooking technique come we on. use that eliminates the need for deep frying, really? preserving the authentic flavor. That's more than five seconds. That felt like an hour. On September the 29th, a routine Saturday meeting was held at the Socialist Club on Burner Street. When the meeting came to a close around midnight, all but a few members returned home. Those who remained proceeded to drink and socialize. Half an hour in September the 30th, Joseph Lave stepped outside to get some fresh air. Lave used the side entrance leading into Dutville's yard and lingered for about 10 minutes. Moments after Lave had gone back inside, Morris Eagle accessed the building via the same entrance. He too was a member of the club and had just returned after escorting a woman home. Neither of them noticed anything unusual. 20 minutes later, the sound of a horse and carriage could be heard trotting down Burner Street. The driver was Louis Diemschutz, the steward of the clubhouse. When Diemschutz drove into Dutville's yard, his pony abruptly veered to the left. When he looked down to his right, he thought he could discern something in the darkness. Diemschutz stepped down from his barrow and after lighting a match, could see a woman lying on her side against the wall. Without even knowing if she was quote, drunk or dead, Dean Schutz rushed inside the club to check on his wife. When he found her safe and sound, he alerted the other members 
and a small crowd soon gathered outside. They could now see that the woman's throat had been, quote, fearfully cut, and that, quote, a stream of blood was trickling down the yard. Eagle, Deemschutz, and a few others promptly dispersed to find a policeman. While a growing crowd of bystanders waited for authorities to arrive, there was no sign of the perpetrator. But across the city, less than a kilometer to the west, an even more ghoulish discovery was about to be made. At half past one of the same morning, Constable Edward Watkins patrolled an open space known as Mitre Square. Watkins' beat would take him through the square about once every 13 minutes, and on this occasion, it was deserted. But in the time it took Watkins to complete another rotation, Mitre Square was turned into a crime scene. I next came in at 1.44. I turned to the right. I saw the body of a woman lying there on her back. I saw her throat was cut and her bowels protruding. The stomach was ripped up. She was lying in a pool of blood. Dr. George Zikera and Dr. Frederick Brown soon converged upon the scene. They found terrible injuries inflicted upon the woman's face, throat, and abdomen. The intestines had been, quote, drawn out to a large extent and placed over the right shoulder. Among the many lacerations to the face, Dr. Brown noted that, quote, the lobe and oracle of the right ear was cut obliquely through. Based on their expert opinions, coupled with the testimony of Watkins, the woman had died within minutes of her body being found. Back in Burner Street, Dr. Frederick Blackwell and Dr. George Phillips had reached the same conclusion. The woman in Dutville's yard had died within minutes of her body being found. But unlike previous victims, she had only suffered injuries to the throat. There were no abdominal mutilations or anything else by which to connect the attack to the others. Was he in a hurry? Did he have to get out of there? But the murder in Dutville's yard... I, as I said in the first video, I, was a, I loved the Jack the Ripper story. Um, fascinated by it as a kid. I think everyone was probably fat. If you, all most guys, but I don't. I haven't kept up with it or even had any interest in it since I was probably ten. Yard, and the one in Mitre Square, were separated by less than one kilometer and some forty-five minutes. This allowed for a chilling possibility. It was suspected then, as it continues to be today that when Deemschutz came clattering through the gateway, he unwittingly interrupted the murder. The killer may even have become trapped inside Dutville's yard because the gate on Burner Street was the only point of entry. Perhaps they saw an opportunity to escape when Deemschutz then rushed inside the club. From there, it would have taken them less than 15 minutes to reach Mitre Square. Plenty of time to hunt for another victim. But it must be emphasized that this is pure speculation. There is no evidence to suggest the two murders were even connected. The woman in Dutville's yard was identified as 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride. Stride was a Swedish immigrant who'd lived in London for over two decades. Following the death of her husband, she had made a living through prostitution. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Stride had been seen by quite an abundance of witnesses. First, she was seen in the company of a quote, respectably dressed man around 11 o'clock. About a quarter to midnight, Stride was seen talking to a man who was quote, decently dressed and had the appearance of a clerk. Then, only a few minutes before the murder, Stride was seen in the company of a man by Constable William Smith. The man was carrying a small parcel wrapped in newspaper and was of quote, respectable appearance. It's unclear whether these descriptions are of the same person or if Stride accosted multiple clients as the night progressed. There were other witnesses, some less credible than others, but the one that really stood out from the rest was Israel Schwartz. About a quarter to one, Schwartz had been walking down Burner Street. As he came up on Dutville's yard, he witnessed a man throwing a woman to the ground 
in front of the entrance. The woman had, quote, screamed three times, but not very loudly. Schwartz would later identify this woman as Elizabeth Stride. Schwartz did not try to intervene, but opted instead to simply cross the street. That's when he spied a second man on the opposite side who was lighting a pipe. The man who attacked the woman then appeared to address the second man by shouting the name Lipsky. The pipe smoker then proceeded to follow Schwartz before eventually breaking away. When taken at face value, this story appears to suggest that the killer had an accomplice, an accomplice by the name of Lipsky. This was indeed the interpretation of some government officials. But Inspector Frederick Abeline, one of the lead investigators on the case, had a very different interpretation. You see, the name Lipsky had gained notoriety in 1887 when a Jewish man by the name of Israel Lipsky was convicted of murder. Owing to the publicity of that case, the surname Lipsky had become an anti-Semitic slur. Abeline therefore deduced that the man who shouted Lipsky was directing an insult at Schwartz, who was described as having a quote, strong Jewish appearance. The man with a pipe, meanwhile, may have been an innocent passerby who became frightened along with Schwartz. Whether Abeline's interpretation is correct, it's doubtful we'll ever truly know. Nevertheless, Schwartz's account is compelling as he conceivably witnessed the moment when Elizabeth Stride was attacked. Back in Mitre Square, a large crowd of spectators had ascended upon the scene, all driven by their morbid curiosity to get a glimpse of the body. The post-mortem revealed that the killer had extracted a few organs, including the womb and left kidney. According to Dr. Brown, this extraction required, quote, a good deal of knowledge, which he likened to that of a butcher. By contrast, Dr. Siqueira did not find any signs of, quote, great anatomical skill. Hmm. The woman in Mitre Square was identified as 46-year-old Catherine Eddowes. I guess if you're a butcher, you don't really have a lot of atomical skill. You're just hacking. Would that be accurate, though? Yeah, because I don't think a butcher doesn't really care. They're just cutting things out, throwing things away, hacking off limbs. Hacking off limbs. For some reason, I started thinking of the Civil War. Sorry. Eddowes had at least five children, but after escaping her abusive husband, she had become estranged from her family. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 55 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Eddowes had been out drinking. She got so drunk that around half past eight, she was found lying on the sidewalk in Aldgate High Street, surrounded by a crowd. Wow. The commotion attracted a few officers, who then escorted Eddowes to a nearby police station. There, she remained locked in a cell until one o'clock in the morning. She was locked up for 30 minutes? No. After being released from jail? <laughs> no. She was locked up for three and a half hours. No. I went to 24. Three and a half, four and a half hours. I went to 21. Obviously, 20 and then 1, so I just made that 21, so it's just 30 minutes. So she's locked up for, that goes to 24, so that would be 3.5 plus the hour. So 4.5 hours. Okay. Well, I just, well, I guess you... You kind of do sober up in four and a half hours. Four and a half hours is a long time for drunk. Of course, if you're really drunk, though, four and a half hours, you need you need 12 hours. Eddowes was likely spotted in the company of a man in the vicinity of Mitre Square. Only one of the three witnesses, Joseph Lavenda, had paid close attention to the couple. The man had the appearance of a sailor 
and wore a quote, reddish handkerchief round his neck. While Lavenda did identify the woman as Catherine Eddowes, he never saw her face. Nevertheless, this sighting was only made some 10 minutes before Edo's body was discovered by Constable Watkins. What's so incredibly tragic about the Edo's case is how narrowly the killer escaped justice. First of all, the only private residence in Mitre Square was occupied by a policeman and his family. They had slept right next to an upper floor window overlooking the murder site. Second of all, a night watchman and retired policeman had been cleaning a warehouse within earshot of the murder site. He would routinely hear the footsteps of patrolling officers, yet heard nothing at the time of the murder. Finally, Constable James Harvey had glanced into Mitre Square at roughly 20 minutes to 2. That's right in between the sighting by Lavenda and the body's discovery. Harvey should have had an unobstructed view of the murder site. So he saw four minutes before the body was found. So was she killed there? Wow. I don't know yet he failed to notice anything suspicious. You know, <clears throat> I want to apologize. I'm pretending like there's street lights around. I'm forgetting the time. I'm thinking there's street lamps all over. You know what I mean? So yeah, she, he, he could have walked down here. She could have been dead. And he's, he's not going to see her if he has a little hand lantern. He's not going to see her. My fault. Was it too dark? Maybe was the killer too much. standing just a few meters away, cloaked in shadow? Did one or more witnesses get the time wrong? While the killer did ultimately escape, they did not do so without leaving a trace. I just want to say I feel terrible for those cops. The cops who found her drunk and then find out later on, yeah, she was released and she's dead now. Oh, that's got to kill you inside. Of course, you don't know. I mean, maybe these cops dealt with death like that all the time. So it was just kind of like, oh, well, that sucks. But, you know, we move on. Which is probably the attitude you have to have if you're a cop anyways. You know, you can't take it personal. You have to keep going at it to, to get the people. And then once you catch them, you can take it personal. You can, you know maybe accidentally slam their head into a toaster or something, you know. But, yeah, I feel terrible. Shortly before cops. three o'clock, a bloodstained piece of cloth was found near the entrance to a building a few blocks to the northeast. It proved to be a ripped portion of the apron worn by Eddowes. The patch had evidently been torn off and then discarded by the killer upon their escape. Now, on the wall above this patch of apron, someone had written a message. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. To this day, both the meaning and the author of this message remain in doubt. Was it written by the killer? Was it an attempt to cast suspicion upon or even away from the Jewish community? Was it completely unrelated to the murder? In school. Wow, what a timing. Uh, in school, for me, we, um, let me go back for a second. Sorry. No, I said I want to go back. Okay. Sorry, I'll get back now, to Now, on the saying. wall above this patch of apron, someone had written a message. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. When I learned about, well, when I learned, when I was told about this in school, they removed all this 
and they just called them the Jays, are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Because they didn't want, they, they did, there were a few that said Jews, and they spelled it this way. But then some of the other teachers would just call them the Jays, and they go, it's a derogatory term, we just don't want to say that. And I always thought, but it's, 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 a, it's a historical thing, like, you know, the Jews are the, like, people say Jews, Jewish. If it were, you know, the N-word, yeah, okay, I get it, I understand. But, like, to me, the Jews, it's like saying the Christians or the Catholics. You know what I mean? It, to me, it's like a religion. It's a religious group. Not so much as um, anything else. So, but they, they were offended. And they Not offended, but they, they didn't want to offend anyone, so they didn't put it up. It just, I, I apologize, it was just a flashback to... To this day, both school. the meaning and the author of this message remain in doubt. Was it written by the killer? Was it an attempt to cast suspicion upon or even away from the Jewish community? Was it completely unrelated to the murder? Similar questions would soon be raised by a few letters. Letters which had supposedly been written and posted by the killer. Three days before the murder of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, the Central News Agency of London received a letter in the post, the author of which claimed responsibility for the recent murders and to be planning for the quote, next job. Then, in the aftermath of the two killings, the same agency received a blood-smeared postcard. It contained details about the atrocities, which the author described as a quote, double event. On the off chance that the letters were genuine, the police decided to make them public. The hope was that someone would recognize the handwriting. Unfortunately, no one ever did. Instead, it merely served to advertise the name with which the letters had been signed. Opinions on the letter's authenticity were divided back then and continue to be today. Most notably, the Dear Boss letter had promised to quote, clip the lady's ears off and send them to the police. The police never received such a package, and neither of the two victims had had their ears removed. But you may recall that the right earlobe of Eddowes had been, quote, cut obliquely through. Was this a botched attempt by the killer to keep their promise? Or was it merely one of numerous lacerations <coughs> with no connection to the letter? The contents of the letters notwithstanding, modern linguistic analysis does suggest that they were penned by the same hand. So, hoaxes or not, the authors were likely one and the same. Huh. However, the handwriting bore, quote, no resemblance at all to the message written above the torn patch of apron. Now, the publication of the letters inspired an onslaught of copycats. Agencies all over London were soon inundated with correspondence imitating the other two. But at least one of them might have been genuine. Not because of the contents of the letter, but rather the contents That's of a box right. with which it was delivered. On October the 16th, a man named George Lusk received a small package in the post. Lusk was the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, a small group of local tradesmen who sought to identify the killer. The package consisted of a letter and a cardboard box containing half a kidney. The doctors who examined the kidney all agreed that it was human. But whether it was the same left kidney removed from the body of Eddowes could not be determined. It could, for instance, have been an elaborate hoax by a medical student or someone with access to human organs. The author of the accompanying letter, meanwhile, insisted that the kidney did belong to the victim and that they had fried and eaten the other half. Ugh. A popular theory at the time, and one that still is today, was that some of the letters had been fabricated by the press. According to Chief Inspector John Littlechild, the letters were, quote, But they said they were all written by the same hand. Oh. Yeah. If the only package you're getting that contains a, a, a liver, maybe that was a different handwriting. 
Did they say that? Am I have I been drinking too much? Yeah, maybe maybe though they were. And maybe the maybe Jack the Ripper sent the kidney to distinguish himself from the other letters. Or maybe I'm just drinking too much. And they said that already. And I've already forgot. Do I have a problem? I need a refill. Let's get on with this a video. smart piece of journalistic work. <clears throat> Assistant Commissioner Robert Anderson dismissed the letters as, quote, the creation of an enterprising London journalist. Meanwhile, Chief Constable Melville McNaughton thought he could discern the, quote, stained forefinger of the journalist. There are a few candidates for who this journalist might have been, but there is no solid evidence against any one of them. Whether it was a hoax by an enterprising journalist or the genuine prose of the Ripper, the letters did nonetheless receive widespread attention. They commanded space in virtually every newspaper and dominated much of the public discourse throughout October, a month which passed without a single atrocity bearing the signature marks of Jack the Ripper. Perhaps it was finally over. It is pretty certain that the monster has become frightened and has suspended his horrible work for the present, if not for good. I'm gonna end this here. It's almost been 17 minutes, but um, we'll break this down two more sections. Um, but I need to get um, another drink and I need to get back into um, sitting down here with my little butt on this seat and man I have been drinking I can feel it but it's okay I gotta put uh, my th oh they're not even cold anymore good job Greg you made them not cold <laughs> he's like the hell did I do yeah they have melted some I've never used them I got them February 2021 and they just they have that they have that uh, you know when you empty out an ice tray they kind of have a, a an emptied out ice tray kind of smell to it and if you don't know what I mean then I don't know how to describe it any better because I've smelled that it's not a bad smell it's just a, a like a frozen kind of smell mm. I'm gonna end the video so I can make another drink and I can sit down and get back into um, part three of four parts for this Jack the Ripper because I'm, I'm digging it the alcohol is helping it's really making it fun like and subscribe um, and real fast thank you to everyone who dug the world war one series um and the russian um history of russia and i'm doing the napoleonic series i'm gonna get into napoleonic wars 1809 to 1811 i think i'm gonna start that tomorrow uh for next week um but i've been getting um my American viewership has dropped to like 25%, 24%. And I'm I'm getting views in Russia, um, the UK, Germany, Romania, Norway. It's just, it seems weird to feel like you are, um, other people are watching your videos from other countries. It just feels, it feels crazy. We're all in touch through this uh, little World Wide Web thing, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's always a privilege to know that uh, people are watching you, subscribing, and all that stuff. So I don't take it for granted. I do appreciate it. And I'm going to end this here, and have a good day. Have a good night. Stay tuned for part three, which I'm going to be filming right after I get a refill of Roman Coke.